Hey everybody, it's Devin. And Kate. Welcome to Med Crimes. Right off the bat, I feel like I got something I want to talk about. First of all, you and I already talked about this, but I I wanted to share it with you guys that the other day I started listening to some of our old episodes, like our (laughs) literal first like three episodes, just out of like nostalgia. And wow. So first of all, we have come so far with our audio quality. It's like wild. And I mean... Mm -hmm. We really appreciate, I mean, the editing was bad. Like, I feel like some of my word choices were not awesome. Like, I just listened back and was, like, kind of cringing. So I wanted to thank all of you who have, like, been there from the beginning and Mm -hmm. or who have gone back and listened to everything after you've found us. Right. Started back from the beginning. And not dumped us as a podcast. (laughs) Because um, I see why you would have gotten very annoyed with all of that jazz, um, but I'm glad you stuck with us. And now I think me and Devin have a nice little groove going. We do. And Kate and I might have briefly touched upon maybe eventually taking some of those early stories mm-hmm. and re-recording them. Yeah, we want to just and like... like just revamp them a little bit. Revamp them. I think that, you I know? mean, I would like to just reclaim those and also like just with the better audio... With the more thorough research, I just think I've learned some stuff and I can Mm -hmm. do it better. Same. Yeah. I think we can do it. It'll be like Janine Jones, Med Crimes version. Yeah. Charlie Cullen, (laughs) Med Crimes 2.0. Yes. It's going to be great. We'll do that like, you know, a little later on. We've got got, like a lot of other The stories are still piling up. So we've we've still just got like things to talk about. Oh, it never stops. I just feel like we have so much. We get so many requests. And the one that we're doing today actually is one that has been heavily requested. And I forever. sent you one the other day in mm-hmm. case you didn't have, and you were like, yes. "Nope, I got some." I was like, "Okay, yep, like, yep, yep." So we yeah. get we we love the request too. Please keep them coming. Yes. And uh, we have some Patreons. Patreons. Okay, we have. Now I'm not sure if this is initials or a first name, but it's H A S or Haas. Keep calling you Haas. Haas. H-A-S or Haas. Okay, so I did just <laughs> have to take, and, take a quick pause and take an urgent phone call from my sister, who never calls me this late at night, so I knew something was going on. Apparently, my brother-in-law grabbed a hot stick around their fire stick. pit. And <laughs> grabbed a hot stick, and he, he burned his hand pretty good. So, sorry, Tim, that that happened, but that's what it's like when you're a medical person in a family of non-medical <laughs> people. you got to answer these phone calls. No rest for you. Yeah. I know my sister will usually laugh sometimes when she'll message me and she'll be like, so I have a question. And I remember one time specifically, I replied to her and go, oh, God, who has what rash? (laughs) (laughs) And no, I don't want to see it. A description (laughs) is more than enough. And then um, I think we were in the middle of Patreons, right? We were. So we had discussed H-A-S or Haas. We love you. And also Allie Z. Elkin. I love that you threw that like sexy middle initial in there. Gotta like, have the Z. Well, I mean, if your middle initial, your middle name starts with Z, I feel like you do have to, by law, include that when you're writing out it's your a name. Thing. It's a thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a thing. Totally, it's documented. Done. It's in the law. I love you. You know what you guys are? You guys are wisps. You know from uh... your imagination is wild. By Thank the you. way, um, wisps. <laughs> Are like from Brave. You know that movie Brave? The little light beings that like dance around in the forest and like lead you places and like lead you to your destiny. Mm -hmm. That's you. So we got a we got a trickety treat today. I'm ready. We're talking old timey. Oh, you love the old timies. You know I love me some old timey med crimes. How old timey? Nineteen hundreds and late eighteen hundreds. Early 1900s, I should say, because 1900s was not that long. (laughs) Or maybe it was. It was 23 years ago. That's old (laughs) timey. This was like 1900, like the 1900. All right. So we are talking about doctor, and I'm heavily quotation marking the doctor, 
Linda Hazard. And you're heavily quoting why? I mean, as usual, we will get there. Oh, we will okay. get into it. <laughs> I'm, I'm always gonna, jumping the gun. I'm burying the lead. I'm not <laughs> I'm not going to just lead with that. I'm going to let it. that unfold organically as per my MO. Mhm. So, quote unquote Dr. Linda Hazard was an American con artist nicknamed the Starvation Doctor. Oh gosh. Who gained notoriety in the early 1900s for her promotion of starvation and fasting as a cure-all for a slew of ailments. I would not do well. <laughs> <laughs> I would not do well. Devin, for the record, Devin would not do well. Nope. Devin would not subscribe to this bullshit. No. Nope. A lot of people died. Devin would be fine. She would survive. In this damage. Well, no, I would actually, in her mind, also die if she used those things for treating ailments. And she. <laughs> because I would not be going for that treatment. <laughs> so if it actually worked. Not laughing out of disrespect to the victims of the situation, what just she the did was actually quite horrible. I'm just laughing at Devin because That's she's fair. funny. That's fair. So. Now, she used fasting as like this cure-all or, you know, advertised it as this cure-all. And her diet was actually primarily administered in this sanitarium that she ran, which took fasting to the absolute extreme. She's thought to be responsible for the starvation deaths of at least 12 people, but it's probably more in actuality. Mm. So it's actually like a crazy, bizarre story. I'm ready. And this is part uno of at least part dos. Wait, of at least de parts. <laughs> There's a lot of languages in what I just said. There's like at least at three languages. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so trigger warning. Um... This will contain heavy themes of an extreme fasting diet. So if eating disorders are particularly triggering, this might not be the episode for you. Skip ahead. Yeah. So Linda was born Linda Laura Burfield in Carver, Minnesota. She was the oldest of seven children of Susanna Neal and Montgomery Burfield. And... These two parents, um, so they had like this bunch of kids, right? And they maintained a vegetarian diet for all their kids. And they were actually wow. really like strict about it. They were kind of like the almond mom people. You know, almond mom. They were like the almond mom of the early, the late 1800s. And so like never wanted to eat meat, extremely health conscious, and always were impressing that upon their kids. and. There were some unusual health practices that began in their home when Linda was a child. So Susanna, her mom, had all their kids seeing this medical provider that she had like this firm belief in. Like, I'm not really sure what this provider's story was, but it seems like things were a little funky there. Um but nevertheless, Linda's mom, Susanna, was like, no, this person is gold and she knows what's up. So this person diagnosed all of her kids with having intestinal parasites, which interesting, unclear if they had that or if that was really a thing. Um, but nevertheless, the doctor prescribed what they used to call blue mass pills for the supposed infections. So... These were also called blue pills or little blue pills back in the day. And they were actually given pretty commonly for like a wide range of ailments. Um, they were one of those like weird products that in the late 1800s, early 1900s would be like, oh, just take this. You'll be fine. You know, there's just like a one little cure-all pill for everything. So people would take them for like headaches, toothaches, constipation, mm -hmm. you know, anything and everything kind of like penicillin back in the day right like yeah. if you needed an antibiotic it was the penicillin was one it of the first and only and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so they prescribed these blue mass pills and 
I found some old reports that supported a ton of people taking these. They were like pretty early on were like flash across the market. Very popular. And, and that's what it was called? Blue mass blue, pills? Blue mass pills or blue pills. Yep. And even Abraham Lincoln was reported to have taken these in the past for his whatever ailments that he suffered from. Um, so these pills were capsules of calomel, which is a form of mercury. Like literal elemental mercury Uh in a pill. So at the time they were prescribed to the kids, the pills had started to be to fall out of favor in the medical community. So the medical community that is on the forefront is kind of realizing, well, you know, these pills have a lot of side effects. And they don't really seem to be actually curing all these things. So I'm probably not going to prescribe them anymore. Some people are still prescribing them, but they're less popular than they were. Starting to phase out. They were starting to phase out. This practitioner, whoever they saw, was like, take the little blue pills. So, um, and then also, like, we hadn't really discovered yet, you know, the effects of mercury. It wasn't necessarily that people were realizing these terrible things that could happen with mercury toxicity quite yet, Mm -hmm. which now we know a lot about. We'll get into that, too. Um, But, you know, these Burfields, they staunchly followed this practitioner and they said, take the pills. So what can happen with mercury poisoning? So prolonged exposure to high doses of mercury can cause kidney damage, liver damage, central nervous system damage, brain atrophy. Um, And the kids took these pills as their parents directed. So the kids would take these pills and then shortly thereafter would become like violently ill because it would cause these like violent gastrointestinal system symptoms like once you take it. So they would you know, have these bouts of vomiting and diarrhea from ingesting all this mercury. And it's strongly felt that Linda's prolonged exposure to high level of mer- high levels of mercury as a child likely had a direct impact on her cognition, her development, and perhaps even her brain function and her mental health as an adult. I think mm-hmm. it all probably, mm-hmm. you know, snowballed from here. And this went on for years. These kids took these pills for years. Even as they were becoming more and more phased out. Mm -hmm. Yep, because their parents said, take the pills. Mm -hmm. So they did. And Linda, as a result, was really unable to nourish herself very well because, I mean, she was constantly having vomiting and diarrhea. Just chronically, food would go through her. You're not sustaining and digesting anything. No, 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 no. So, And then in her later childhood and early teen years, she even began losing her adult teeth. Like, her teeth were falling out. Oh, gosh. I mean, this created, you know, because when mercury builds up in the body, it... It never leaves. Mm -hmm. And it just continues to create problems. And damages. And damage. Yeah, exactly. So she routinely voiced her disdain for modern medicine. medicine. Like at this point in her life as like a teen, she was like, you know, I I just don't like medicine. I don't like taking pills. I don't like medicine in general. um, Because I think she got just such a bad taste from what she was exposed to as a kid. For sure, for sure. you know, in her opinion, these you pills... You can respect that. You know, mm-hmm. I was fine, and I took these pills, and now I'm, like, chronically ill. I'm a chronically ill teenager, and this is, like, not great. So, in 1886, Linda turned 18 and promptly moved away from her parents. So, she, like, as soon as she turned 18, she had met this guy and married him very quickly. This guy was a 32-year-old oh. named Erwin Perry. And mm. so, she... Leaves her parents, age 18, is already married off to Erwin. And within the next five years, Linda had had two children of her own. Now, I read um, this incredible book called Starvation Heights by Greg Olson, which gave me, you know, 99% of the source material for this case and is incredibly comprehensive and has um, survivor accounts and things like that. And it's an incredible read, Starvation Heights by Greg Olson. You should read it. Um, And according to this book, Linda never really loved being a mom. Um, And it became clear when her children were very young that she was just one of those people that was like not meant to be a mom. She really never had a great interest in it as a child. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And like for me, I you know, I, I get it. You know, people who don't want kids should not have kids. Right. You know? Right. Um, and I sympathize with her a little bit on this because back then, you know, it's a different time. And Correct. as a young woman, you're under all this social pressure to do what women did back then, which was to get married and have children. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that was your role. That was, that your, was job. your role. That was that your was, duty. That was your duty. And committing to not marrying or having kids back then would make you like a social pariah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that would just like ruin your life and mm-hmm. all possible aspects. So back then, you know, it wasn't like a woman could just like go off on her own and not have kids and not get married. She, you know, that was her lot in life. Mm-hmm. And she kind of followed through went through all the motions and decided that wow you know i really should never have done this it was not for me that's sad but like still you had the kids you made Mm -hmm. the decision Mm -hmm. and you do have a responsibility to see that through because Mm -hmm. they didn't choose you as a parent absolutely Um, you chose to have them so In 1891, because she's kind of struggling to be a present mom in her kids' lives, her marriage begins to deteriorate as a result of that. You know, Erwin is thinking she's not as attentive and motherly as she should be. And she's just like, I kind of want to just fuck off and do my own thing, like to be quite honest. And Mm -hmm. she's starting to look for a distraction and a way to kind of, you know, find herself again and, you know, reclaim her identity as a human being. She's still struggling with chronic health issues. You know, she's lost a lot of her adult teeth. And she's had terrible digestive issues. Even since she stopped taking the mercury pills, it shredded mm-hmm. her inside. Inside, So she's got, like, this chronic colitis and gastritis, duodenitis. So painful. So painful. I mean, she's, this is, she's living with this for the mm-hmm. rest of her life. And she's in pain a lot. She's got chronic abdominal pain. And she's struggling with her mental health and trying to cope with everything. So, and she's always been interested in science and very deeply interested in the physiology of how everything works and the medicine behind it. And while she staunchly objected to modern medicine, she was like, well, I mean, health and wellness is of a great interest to me. And, you know, maybe I can help people by leading them a, on an alternative pathway. You know, mm-hmm. let's try to get more a more naturopathic approach to medicine. And um, what she ended up doing um, was enrolling in a program to become an osteopath. Back then, an quote-unquote osteopath was not what it is now. Back then, it was like a health practitioner who specializes in osteopathic and holistic medicine. And programs were sort of just being developed. Osteopathy in general was a very new field. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was very intriguing to her because all of it was very alternative. It was very uh, non-traditional. Pill, pill, pill. Not so chemically Mm -hmm. focused and more, you know, being in tune with nature, being in tune with our bodies. And and that was uh, fascinating to her. Now, we have osteopaths these days and... um, Doctors of osteopathy actually go through extremely similar training to that that MDs do. And they have medical schools that will give you an MD or a DO, or they have specialty DO um, programs. But they are required to complete the exact same internships and the exact same residencies, and a lot of them sort of intermingle. I know that when I worked at a teaching hospital, we would have um, residents that were MDs in groups with residents that were DOs, and they were sort of interchangeable. And osteopaths can be surgeons they can be family medicine they can be podiatrists they my, can be um, neurologists my they can specialize in anything was yeah was my, an osteopath yeah, yeah she was mm-hmm. so essentially they function very similarly or essentially the same as mm-hmm. an md and the difference is really in just the philosophy the mm-hmm. philosophy of it is very whole patient oriented and treating the patient as a whole you know looking at Not just this person's blood pressure, but, you know, what's their diet? What's their home situation? How much stress do they have? How much do they weigh? Everything all together and kind of building a a whole patient picture in accordance with one problem. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's just the the philosophy behind it that's really different. But in actuality, the practice, the scope of practice is identical to that of an MD. So Mm -hmm. they're held to a very high regard nowadays. Back then, just sort of getting developed, fairly new field, and not a whole lot was known about it yet. But very, very, very intriguing for Linda Burfield at the time. 
So she enrolls herself in this program to become an osteopath. And as it turns out, even in the 1890s, while it's still a new science and programs were really just being developed, the coursework required a lot of conventional practices and conventional medicine. I mean, just like it does now. Mm -hmm. This was something Linda had struggled with her whole life. You know, the traditional approach to medicine, but she had to learn those sciences. She had to learn basic chemistry. She had to learn anatomy and physiology. You need to know how the body works. But she was having a really hard time wrapping her head around actual science. So she actually ended up leaving the program altogether very quickly after she joined it. Okay. So in 1896, she decides to drop out of that osteopathy program and she immerses herself in her own independent studies. She says, you know, if I can't find a program that suits me, I'm just going to start researching this myself. I'm and make my own program? I like, guess make my own decisions about, mm. you know, what I believe in. And maybe I can be some kind of independent healing, like healer or guide or something like that. She's studying on her own. She encounters a work called The True Science of Living, The New Gospel of Health, which was written by a former army surgeon, Dr. Edward Dewey. And this piece that she read was sort of summarizing a natural approach to healing and medicine. And it seemed like something that was a great fit for Linda. She read that and she was like, this exactly aligns with my belief system. Like, mm -hmm. I finally found something by someone who's like-minded with me. This fits perfectly. So she started looking for other things that he had written. And he had written a number, of, a number of pieces, and she, you know, compiled everything. She's like, oh, man, like, I love this guy. Who is this guy? And she researched Dr. Dewey and actually ended up reaching out to him herself. She wrote him a bunch of letters begging him to allow her to study under him as his personal student. And after letters and letters and letters, he did eventually agree. Um, so she spent some years working and studying with Dr. Dewey, like unofficially. They just kind of got together, went over stuff. He taught her what he thought was medicine mm -hmm. um, and taught her what he thought his approach was. And her thought was like, wow, you know, this guy is an absolute innovator. He is way ahead of his time. And I'm, I'm and you know, if I learn from him and practice what he's teaching me, I'm going to be like on the forefront of medical discovery. Like, I mean, she's not wrong. No, you know, she's I, not. like, look how much that type of philosophy has come now. A hundred percent. And how many more natural healings and mm -hmm. different things that we have and homeopathic stuff. And exactly. So it's a true. Huge world. It is. It's mm -hmm. massive. And in 1898, her husband of 12 years reportedly vanishes. And Linda stated at the time that he had left her with the children, with her he, kids. He left he her? He left her with the kids. But apparently the neighbors that lived next to them told reporters later on that, no, actually it was the other way around. She told him to get out and essentially left him with the kids to raise. She said, I don't want to be a wife anymore. I don't want to be a mom anymore. Take the mm -hmm. kids and go. So I don't know what happened, you know, what, and maybe it was something in the middle of the road. Either I way, don't know. he's not with her. Either and way. And she doesn't have her children. In 1898, she and her husband separate, and she is now a woman who is not taking care of her children. So that's something that's happening. Following, okay. So she pursues a legal divorce over the next year or so, and the courts granted it, and it was finally finalized in 1902. So it took a few years to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and then by 1902, you know, she had been studying with Dr. Dewey for a few years now, and she decides to open her own osteopath practice in downtown Minneapolis, which is where she had lived. And... She started promoting her specialty as medical fasting, which is something that she had learned a lot about from Dr. Dewey, who was also a um, avid proponent for medical fasting. So fasting, which is going for long periods of time without food or nutrition, or going periods of time without food and nutrition, I should say, um, 
If you're doing it for short periods, it's actually not typically harmful as long as one is maintaining hydration. Um, there have been actually some studies lately that show that there are some actual benefits like metabolically and cognitively for fasting for brief periods during the day. And a lot of people... Intermittent fasting intermittent is a huge fasting. thing right now. It is a huge thing. And um, I got to tell you, I've actually intermittent fasted in the past. And um, I followed a plan that was I had to fast for 16 hours during the day. And I had an eight-hour window in which I could eat. And mm -hmm. I got to tell you, I actually felt amazing. And I lost weight. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I, I actually... I don't do it anymore. I should do it because I felt great, Devin should but <laughs> but it's a thing that a lot of people do and actually um they say that it kind of speeds up um cellular turnover and the cleanup of like cellular byproducts and mm -hmm. like it has all these crazy benefits so it's actually pretty interesting to read about and i kind of went down a rabbit hole with it because <laughs> i was like oh intermittent fasting again <laughs> <laughs> um also going to issue a reminder that this podcast is simply the opinions of two people who happen to work in healthcare who are shooting the shit in a basement and should absolutely not be taken as actual medical advice or practice standards. I love that disclaimer. This is your PSA. I feel like I should include that. We are in not every telling episode. you what to do. No, we are not. We are two besties. Yeah. Just having a convo. Literally in my basement. Over decaf coffee. <laughs> At 9.13 p.m. <laughs> so please, for the love of God, don't, don't try any of this at home, okay? Now, according to Hopkins Medicine, fasting for much longer periods, like 48 hours, 72 hours, or more, not necessarily any better for you and can actually become dangerous at that point. Going this long without eating actually encourages your body to start going into starvation mode and without calories to burn for energy... Even if you're not doing anything, your body will start to break down other tissues in order to remain functional. This includes muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. Muscle tissue is a big one. Organ tissue. Things that we don't necessarily want to not break down. Not just your fat tissue. No, nope, not just the fat tissue. It can cause um, electrolyte imbalances, which if severe enough, severe enough, excuse me, can be fatal. And over time, malnutrition sets in, which places you at risk for heart failure, liver failure, renal failure. And the body is actually a very resilient thing. And given the opportunity to do so, it can actually last many days or even weeks without food. Um, but this would be, of course, extremely detrimental to one's health. Ultimately, mm -hmm. without food, nobody can live forever. Just because you can live, you're not thriving. No, you're not thriving. Mm -hmm. Living is not thriving. So the big problem here, she was opening this practice, but she had not attended any formal training whatsoever. Oh, boy. And was not a doctor. Not even close mm -hmm. to being a doctor. Mm -hmm. Couldn't understand basic science. Right. Because she just didn't want to subscribe to science. Now, <laughs> at the time, medical licensing laws were shockingly lackadaisical. Like, no. no <laughs> there were loopholes everywhere. No kidding. There were very few actual hard and fast rules here surrounding licensure especially when it came to osteopathy because it was so new and mm -hmm. nobody was really thriving in that right now. And with a well-written application and the help of wildly underdeveloped standards and legislation, it was not technically illegal for her to advertise herself as a doctor when she did not, in fact, hold a license to practice any kind of medicine. Isn't that wild? Herein starts the debate of illegal versus immoral. Well, exactly. That's it. just because you can do it does not mean you should do it. I read a book once where, um, actually recently, where this guy changed his name so that his legal last name was whatever it was, Esquire. Oh. And so when he would say who he was, people assumed he was an attorney. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And then they're so then they're trying to sue him because oh you gave me all this legal advice because you're saying you're an attorney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are fucking that was crazy, in a book. bro. That was in a book. <laughs> so, quote unquote, Doctor Linda Burfield just straight up started calling herself Doctor Burfield. I'm and gonna call myself Doc. 
Yeah, I think you should. It I mean, you. I at least understand basic science. Yeah, I mean, at least you... I got that leg up. ...went to a program. Yeah. Right? So you're a doctor now. That's fine. No, I am not. <laughs> PSA time again. <laughs> we are not doctors. She just, like, is, you know, calling herself doctor and just fucking running. She's running with it. Dr. Linda. Now, in late 1902, she had just started her practice... 41-year-old Gertrude Young comes in to see Linda at her clinic, and she had had a stroke two years prior. And she had been to various traditional doctors, but was very frustrated at the fact that she was not regaining any feeling or strength in her affected hand and leg. So she was having trouble walking. She really couldn't use her arm at all. So she was starting to feel pretty desperate, and because of the failures of modern medicine to, you know, give her the ability to regain function in these limbs... She decided to seek an alternative medical route. So she saw Dr. Linda Burfield, who promised her that fasting would give her back sensation and function in her affected limbs two years after having a stroke. She made a promise. Promised her. I mean, don't we always say, like, we don't make promises in medicine? Mm, Yeah, we don't. I mean, you really shouldn't promise promise anything. I mean, the biggest issue was this. That obviously her stroke was two years ago, and if you've not regained any function in the affected side, the likelihood that you will regain any function at that point is extremely low. And while this was early in medicine, I mean, this was like a known thing. You know, mm-hmm. you have this stroke, this event. If you lose function, it ain't going to come back. I mean, mm-hmm. they knew that much mm-hmm. back then because people were having strokes. Mm-hmm. Um. And once you do have a stroke, I mean, it's, you know, it causes irreversible damage to brain and nerve tissue that does not regenerate. So, you know, if you think about the science behind it, again, science. Hey. You know, it just, we we know that sometimes, you know, after a stroke in the immediate period, like say the few days to weeks following following a stroke, sometimes there's some inflammation in the brain that will calm down and you will make a little bit of a recovery. And once you hit that two-year mark, that's your baseline. That's not going to get any better. So we know this. Doctors back then likely knew this as well. But she was told, she was probably told this repeatedly, but that's not what she wanted to hear, unfortunately. So given the failures of modern medicine to restore her function, she sought out the help of Dr. quote-unquote Linda Burfield. Mm -hmm. So Linda hurriedly prescribed her a 40-day fasting cure oh gosh she gave her a plan 40 day for intaking a teeny tiny amount of nutrition that she could have per day which amounted to like less than 300 calories per day gosh tiny amount negligible amount and she also instructed her to keep her house cold make sure even though it's winter time keep your windows open keep your house freezing cold because that's going to help cure you also oh man So Gertrude had done what Linda instructed her to do, and she fasted, and she followed this plan. 33 days in, she had lost a ton of weight. She was weak. She was frail. She started feeling very sick. All of a sudden, she's now vomiting. She can't keep anything down. She was freezing cold. And you know, if you're cold, you're burning a shitload of energy just trying to keep your body temperature up. Mm -hmm. So... There was a nurse that was visiting Gertrude in her home, and she was like an independent nurse. She was not working with Linda. She was hired by Gertrude as someone to, like, come help her with this fast and help keep an eye on her. And this nurse, around day 33, went and saw her, and, you know, she was conscientious enough to recognize that this was becoming a medical emergency. Yeah. And she picked up the phone, and she called a local physician, an actual physician who worked in the community. doctor. Not Linda. She's like, I'm not calling that lady. She calls this physician. The doctor comes in to make a house call and sees her and is just absolutely floored by what mm-hmm. he sees, you know. And he talks to Gertrude and he's like, you know, her her weight, she was only 105 pounds at this point. Oh, wow. 105 pounds. She was extremely frail, extremely dehydrated. And he said, you need to eat and drink. Yeah. Like, first and foremost, you need to drink and then you need to eat something uh-huh. like right now. And he advised her strong. He said, you will die. Like, I strongly advise Mm -hmm. you to eat and drink or you will die. You are dying. Gertrude 
refused. What? Mm -hmm. She continued to fast for an additional six days. This this didn't scare her, getting to this critically ill no, part? No, she was so convinced by what Dr. Burfield, Linda, had told her that she was just like, if I can just follow the program, if I can just get through this 40 days, you know, she was desperate. She wanted her, the function of her limbs back. You know, she's like, this is my last hope at getting the function of my limbs, if I can oh, just make it. my goodness. So... Gertrude continued to fast six more days, slowly succumbing to malnutrition. Mm -hmm. And on day 39, on November, in November of 19, 1902, uh, Gertrude Young died. Uh, so, What's she got to say about that, Doc? Well, that's the thing. Because this other physician had been involved now and mm -hmm. this nurse had seen this thing unfold... People got wind of this, mm -hmm. and the media got wind of this, and investigators got wind of this. Now, authorities, um, you know, first and foremost, um, sorry. So, authorities had gotten wind of this practitioner in the area that was prescribing 40-day fasts for people. And this physician was like, this is so dangerous. This woman cannot be out here telling people to not eat for 40 days. Like, it's going to kill more people. Mm -hmm. And immediately authorities start a little bit of like a pre-investigation on Linda over this entire situation. Linda goes on record to say that because of Gertrude's death, the cause of Gertrude's death was paralysis. It wasn't oh, dehydration. It wasn't malnutrition. It was what she came to see me for, her paralysis. And it's absolutely impossible that the fast had anything whatsoever to do with her death. So, thankfully, authorities disagreed. And the physician that had seen Gertrude in her home conducted her autopsy. Oh, no. And he concluded after this examination that she had indeed died of starvation and a severe dehydration. Um, she had severe muscle wasting. One finding that struck him as interesting during her autopsy was that her body contained almost no blood. Um, and according to Hawkins Health, um, low intake of iron and severe dehydration can lead to a significant decrease in blood volume. And, you know, along with this, our organs are shutting down in response to the malnutrition. So she may not have even been able to produce like enough erythropoietin from her kidneys, which were wow. probably severely injured from all of this. So that could have added to the lack of blood volume. But the doctor that did this autopsy still felt like, wow, there's like, even even with those factors, mm -hmm. there's like barely any blood. And he really actually strongly feel that there felt that there was a component of blood loss that played a role in her death. Mm -hmm. But he was never able to figure out where that came from, how that happened. And that's a little bit of mystery surrounding her death. Like she died partially also of blood loss, but we have no idea how, how or why or what happened. I'm intrigued. It's interesting, right? So the media, like I said, gets a hold of all this. And the local paper runs this big article that essentially calls Linda Burfield a witch doctor and a hack. And insinuated that she was responsible for Gertrude's death. And it also contained like a little bit of a statement from the doctor that had seen Gertrude, who was a pretty well-respected member of the community. I mean, he mm -hmm. was, you know, he treated people in the community. And he said in this article that he hoped that she would be tried for Gertrude's murder because he oh, thought wow. he was holding her personally responsible for that. Linda subsequently goes on record after this saying that Gertrude's death was Gertrude's own fault. For what? She went on record to say that Gertrude's condition was actually improving significantly days before she came acutely ill, but then she stopped following the treatment plan, as I had outlined. I call bullshit. And this is what caused that abrupt decline. And she just shirked any and all responsibility whatsoever for Gertrude's death. And now people are kind of noticing that She's changing her story a little bit because wasn't it you that said that actually paralysis killed her? Mm -hmm. And now you're saying it's because she wasn't following the program that mm -hmm. that killed her? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're changing the narrative Pick a little one. bit. So she's starting to gain some negative attention locally about this. So the community is starting to turn on her a little bit and she's becoming like a little bit of a pariah. So 
Here's where not having a formal license actually helped Linda in this situation. Because she is not actually licensed to practice medicine, it was not technically illegal for a layperson to advise another layperson on a health practice. That's just like, you know, Mm -hmm. two gal pals having a conversation. Hey, maybe try this. In the eyes of the law, it was Gertrude that decided voluntarily to undergo this (sighs) treatment on her own volition. Even though she was listening to direction, despite Linda having advertised herself as a doctor falsely Mm -hmm. and a healer and a specialist, at that time... That's where fraud comes into play, though, right? Yeah. Well, the the thing is, they're just... The laws were not robust enough to cover this type of situation. And at the time, you know, unfortunately, falsely advertising yourself as a doctor is... Was not something that was technically illegal at the time. right. So as long as she was a regular citizen, she could keep doing what she wanted. Which is how she got to 11 more people. Exactly. At least. Oh, gosh. So, given that technically nothing illegal had transpired here, the investigation was sort of over before it really started. And had they been able to look more into this, they might have noticed that several pieces of very nice and very expensive jewelry and other belongings were missing from Gertrude's home. And there was really only... You know, a few people that had regular access to Gertrude's home in those last few weeks, Linda being one of them. And Linda never admitted to taking anything, but it is more than likely that she did. It's like widely believed that she did. So I think that Linda's whole situation, I think she started off with good intentions, maybe, but I think the mental health of everything... Kind she of started off with good intentions as far as what she came from as a child. Set out to having, do. Having yeah. to take pills that yeah. were like damaging her body system mm-hmm. and everything and then wanting to shy away from that and go more natural routes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. However. 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 You got to do a lot more studies than what she's been doing. Yeah. And I think the thing is, is she's starting to realize here that, wow, I might be able to like fiscally benefit if and like take advantage of people who are naive and who want, you know, my alternative healing approaches. All I have to do is swear up and down that I can literally cure anything and... I don't have to be held legally accountable for it because it's not technically illegal. <clears throat> That's a big problem. Isn't it a big problem? It's a big problem. Mm-hmm. So now we're moving out of 1902. And while it's still technically she's allowed to practice because she's not facing any legal re- she's recourse. She's technically not practicing anyway. No, she's not. Her reputation has been absolutely sullied in the community. So around this time, she's, you know she's like god you know i i kind of got to get out of here i got to turn over a new leaf like something's got to change here cuz she's not just not doing so hot in minneapolis so around the same time she actually meets this handsome gentleman by the name of samuel hazard and he was super handsome the two hit it off really easily and he seemed to like really reciprocate the feelings mm-hmm. for her unfortunately sam was already married Uh Uh-oh. So that's kind of a bummer. But that did not stop the two from engaging in a torrid affair. Uh Uh-oh. Scandalous. so scandalous. So initially he's telling his wife, Viva, that he and Linda are just business partners. And that's why they're spending so much time together. Linda was convinced that Sam would make this great addition to her practice. And he could help sort of run the business end of things while she did the quote-unquote medical healy guru crap that she Mm -hmm. was inventing herself. But initially, so initially Sam's wife was like, okay. Um, But then started to grow a little sus of their relationship. And at one point, his wife actually received a really nasty letter in the mail stating that Linda was actually Sam's lover and the two are having an affair and your marriage is over. Guess who wrote that? Ding, 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 yeah. ding, ding. So um, Sam at that point, you know, after all of that happened, he was fighting with his wife and he was he was like, you know, I really I do owe it to Viva to really try and make it work. So he broke it off briefly with Linda at that point and was like, I'm going to stay with my wife. But and I think he was really trying to reconcile. But unfortunately, Linda didn't back down. By November of 1903, Linda and Sam 
all of the sudden were legally married. What? The problem with this is that Sam was also still legally married to his wife, Eva. Did they have bigamy logs at that point? Stay tuned. This gets wild. This is oh, this is fucking bonkers. So he's still married legally to his wife, Eva. He also neglected to tell her that he was just going to, like, get up, leave the house, and fucking marry Linda all of a sudden. Guess what I'm doing today? So Sam, on he and Linda's wedding night goes to tell his wife, Viva, that he just went and married someone else. She is, of course, devastated and beside herself and pissed. So now she picks up the phone and calls her father. Viva does. Viva's dad is apparently some important man in the community. I think he's some kind of politician, and he has, like, ties with the local government. So she calls her dad and convinced her dad to petition the courts to file bigamy charges against Sam. To, yeah. you know, get okay. get all of this straightened out because technically he's now married to two people at once, unbeknownst mm-hmm. to one of them. And <laughs> this whole this situation, this whole marriage and bigamy thing actually garnered a ton of media attention, mostly because of the media attention that Linda Hutt had mm-hmm. gotten around Gertrude's death. Now they're saying, look, the witch doctor just married a married man and now he's being tried for bigamy right, and right. this is a Ruining lives in all different ways. Dumpster fire. Like, th- this is crazy. And so that didn't help that Linda, you know, she was this like quack doctor and she had already gotten all this, you know, negative attention and the media was absolutely eating it up so they're closely following this whole dramatic situation as it unfolds and it does go to court and there's a it's all very chaotic so sam is tried for bigamy and is found guilty and he is sent to the state penitentiary to serve time for bigamy because he married linda and the media absolutely vilified Linda, again, because of who she was. And essentially, people kind of took Sam's side and sympathized with him going to jail mm. just for getting mixed up with Linda, who's this crazy... I mean, he I can did see ba- how it's spun, but he made his own bed. It, well, I agree I agree with you completely, but that's how it was spun right. in the media. And now the community is like, oh, poor Sam. He married this, you know, horrible witch lady who mm-hmm. now he's in jail and she's ruining everything. And so... Anyway, th- this what a fucking time to be alive. I know I say that during every episode at some point because <laughs> what a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. So Sam spends two years in jail. Oh for my bigamy. goodness! This entire time, he's still waffling between Linda and Viva. I mean, you would think that jail would solidify your choice. I I feel like maybe for most it would. Most for most. Um, I don't know why Viva is so desperate to to keep Sam. Let him the fuck go, girl. Different you are, time. It's I understand. Like yeah, you you're said, right. when you're not married and no, whatever else, and so then she if didn't want to be a divorcee. That was just divorcee as much of with a, children. Yeah, and, yeah no, I understand. Social Ugh. stuff. So he is sprung from prison after two years, and he sprung! finally makes his decision on who he's going to be with. Which one? Linda. Oh! I know. I said the same thing. I was like, come on, Sam. <sighs> come on, man. So he makes this decision. He's going with Linda. So he's leaving his wife behind. And now he and his new wife pick up and they head west. They're like, we need to leave Minneapolis. We need to start anew. So in 1906. I bet he regrets that decision. Oh, God. I fucking We're not even through this. And we're I'm not sure, even. I think he regrets dude. this decision. <laughs> You know, it's 1906. Linda and Sam are married. They're moving away from Minneapolis and they're resettling and they end up in Seattle, Washington. So Linda is jumping back into it. They're in Seattle. And step number one is applying for, you know, medical licensure as an osteopath. So she goes to the Washington State Medical Board. She applies for a medical license, citing her experience as an osteopath and a fasting specialist, and the board reviewed everything. And of course, again, in Seattle as well, the laws are very lackluster and very similar to those in Minnesota. Not tightly, not tightly, wow, not tightly regulated at all. 
and especially when it came to osteopathy. Eventually, the board approved her application and issued her a license to practice medicine. So according to the state of Washington at this point, she's a doctor. Crap. Although she's never had any formal medical training. You would think that she wouldn't want to apply for a licensure knowing she got away with it the first time. You would think. But now she thinks she's untouchable and yep. she'll still be able to cure people. And... I think so. And maybe she's like got some new strategies about like how she's going to mitigate that in the future. And maybe I'll just be more careful. But. Quote unquote doctor. So she opens up our little practice in downtown Seattle. And the thing about Seattle is that the area is a lot more progressive, a little bit more liberal. And her mm-hmm. thought process was they might be more accepting as a community of right. my alternative approach. Mm-hmm. So the claims that Linda, now calling herself Dr. Linda Hazard, because that's her new last name, um, was that she could heal. The things that she was claiming were just absolutely outlandish. So she claims that she has healed everything from cancer to heart disease Stop. to brain disorders to Literally everything. You name it. To bringing them back from the dead. I could do it all. I'm an alchemist. Step into my office, lie on my table. Oh, boy. So people were actually eating it up. They they loved it. Everybody was very curious about it. Everyone was poking their heads in there like, oh. And no one knew what happened in Minnesota. Nope. Mm Mm-mm. I mean, there was no social media. There was no, like, Mm -hmm. world news at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, so by the end of 1907... A client by the name of Daisy Hagland had been seeing Linda. And she was very excited about this whole alter- alternative approach. She had a number of minor ailments that she hoped would be amended by Linda's treatments. And Linda prescribed her a fasting regimen wherein she could only take very small amounts of nutrition. And what she could take was like a small amount of liquid throughout the day, such as sips of tomato broth or orange juice. That's it. And her one hard and fast rule was absolutely no meat. Linda boasted that this was the worst thing you could do for your body to was to eat any meat whatsoever. So she said, stop eating meat. Now, when Daisy would come in to get her treatments from Linda, she would lie on the table in front of Linda and Linda would beat her with her fists as part of her treatment in an effort to improve circulation. (laughs) She would like beat her thighs her legs, her torso, her back, her forehead, just beat, beat, like creating bruises. What the heck? Yeah, everywhere. And um, she instructed Daisy to take walks every single day, no matter how exhausted she was, no matter how little energy she had, you got to get up and walk, got to do it, get outside and walk. She said, you do this, you will be cured of any and all maladies that you have. So the other thing that Linda prescribed to Daisy was to ensure that she had a daily enema. Oh, no. Daily enema. Sometimes twice daily enemas. Ugh. Her belief was that purging the bowels would allow patients to flush the toxins out of their gut more efficiently. So, enemas. All kinds of enemas. For how long? For the entirety of this 40-day program. Not only is she not taking anything in... But she's cleaning it all out. Mm -hmm. Now, an enema here and there to treat constipation or to prep for a procedure is not harmful and, in fact, can be very helpful with constipation. Mm -hmm. But doing them consistently can be very dangerous because the solutions that are used in an enema via osmosis actually draw more fluid via the colon and out of the body Mm -hmm. and can hit like further dehydration especially in somebody who's already going to be profoundly malnourished and dehydrated and with the fluid loss comes more electrolyte loss Mm -hmm. so essentially doing this can hasten malnutrition malnutrition setting in like by a lot so i mean she's just depleting 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 all of her stores she she doesn't even have a chance of making it to day 33 you know like no And sadly, in February of 1908, coincidentally on her 38th birthday, Daisy died of severe dehydration and malnutrition following Linda's practices. I can just picture her, too, like, as Mm -hmm. she's starting to feel worse, trying to get up and take those walks. Yeah, just huffing and puffing. Linda (sighs) says, I have to do it. I have to tough it out. Just burning and burning and burning through all of her reserves. Oh, my goodness. 
And on that incredibly sad note, dun, dun, dun. we're wrapping it up. Wait for part two. <sighs> uh, this makes me want to eat food. Let's go upstairs and <laughs> fucking cook a steak, bitch. <laughs> let's eat our meat. <laughs> let's eat some cows. Thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, if if you want to continue listening to us and hearing all the stuff we have to say, please follow us on Instagram at Medcrimes Podcast. You can tweet at us at Medcrimes PC. You can search us on Facebook at Medcrimes Podcast. If you wish to become a Patreon, you can find us at www.patreon.com slash Medcrimes Podcast. You can also send us any crazy stories, any, um, wow. Okay. <laughs> any ideas for <laughs> topics? <laughs> Whoa, this is enlightening. We are not joking. It's a, it's a mess. You could here. really send us whatever you want at <laughs> medcrimes at gmail.com. You can just send us a whole <laughs> rambling list of squares and fucks. That and would be good, too. I'd, I'd read that shit. That'd be yep. great. I like it. We love you guys so much again. Thank you for sticking with us, especially those of you who are with us, like, in the trenches of episodes one through ten. <laughs> those trenches. <laughs> those were trenchy episodes. <laughs> Take care, everyone.